we talked about performance de design metrics. Uh, people have been using different number of uh, performance metrics to measure the performance of a system. For example, clock frequency, instructions per second, uh, those are not good measures. Because uh, based on the architecture of the processor, uh, a processor with 1.2 gigahertz may not be uh, as fast as another processor uh, with a different instruction set running at 1.0 gigahertz. So clock frequency is not always a good indication of the performance, especially when you compare different kinds of processors. Uh, same thing for the instructions per second, because when you have different instruction set, uh, you may have to use different number of instructions to implement the same um, program, software program. Uh, one concrete example is for the digital camera. A user cares more about how fast it processes the image rather than the clock speed of the processor or the instructions per second. So we talked about latency, which is defined as the time between task start and end. So when you start a task, you start the clock and then you end the clock when the task finishes. That's the execution time or the latency. On the other hand, uh, we use throughput to measure the um, number of tasks completed in a unit time. So latency and throughput are measuring different things, although they have close relationship between each other. If you have a processor that completes a single task at a time, then the throughput is one over the latency. However, if you have a different design where a processor can process multiple tasks at the same time in parallel or in a pipeline fashion, then the throughput is not the same as one over the latency. It's going to be more than that because you have more tasks running and, of course, more tasks completing uh, in a unit time. Uh, I believe I gave an example last time um, to let you calculate the throughput when you have two cameras. Uh, one is doing the single task processing, the other one is doing the um, parallel or pipeline processing. So you remember we calculate um, the throughput, uh, which is uh, different um, between these two cases. And the speed up uh, is defined as um, the B's performance over A's performance if we want to compare uh, the performance between these two. Now the speed up could be latency speed up or the throughput speed up. Um, but often the case we use throughput uh, as the measurement for the speed up. In the next set of slides, I will talk about um, so-called design technologies a technology refers to the manner of accomplishing a task, especially using technical processes, methods, or knowledge. We're going to look at three key technologies for embedded system design. Processor technology, IC technology, and design technology. And we're going to go over each one of them. Processor technology. We use processors including microprocessors or microcontrollers in all these embedded systems. The architecture of this computation engine used to implement a system's desired functionality could be very different. A processor that we use may or may not be programmable. Even if it's programmable, it may not be able to let you program at all levels or use all different languages. So the processor here, we refer to not necessarily a general purpose processor. It could be a um, FPGA, or it could be an ASIC chip that is not programmable. In this slide, on this slide here, we are showing you 
three different kinds of processor technologies. From left to right, we have here general purpose processors. That's the ones you are very familiar with. You use it every day. Um, any uh, Intel processor in your laptop, uh, or the ones we're going to use in the lab, the Atom processors, uh, general purpose processors. The second type of processor is so-called application-specific processors. Um, these processors are designed for a special purpose. For example, graphics processors, um, speech um, processors. And these processors have dedicated special unit uh, that is optimized for certain function. For example, uh, doing this uh, ray tracing or doing this uh, digital signal processing on the speech signals. On the other extreme, we have uh, so-called single purpose processors. These processors uh, have even simpler functionality. It's designed for just one task. It could be very simple. And oftentimes, you cannot program it um, using very uh, sophisticated high-level languages. So we want to use this diagram here to show you the differences between or among these different processor technologies, general purpose, application specific, or single purpose. Suppose the design functionality is uh, very specific. In here, we want to um, calculate the sum of n numbers, and these n numbers are stored in the array m. So if you auto solve this problem, you can write a C language program such like this. You have a for loop. You count from 1 to n, and you do a summation of all the numbers. Right? That's how you solve the problem using software. And we illustrate this solution using the black cross here that shows, OK, we have this specific problem to solve, and here's our solution. At the bottom here, we show three different kinds of options, well, approaches that we can take. First one is the general purpose processor. So it's a rectangular box. And you can fit in not only this black cross in it, you can fit in all other different components. And that is to say, you can write a program that not only solve this problem, you can use it to solve additional problems or different problems. In the middle, that's application-specific processor. It's a reduced set of the rectangular box. Uh, it has some specific processing units available. Uh, from function-wise, it can do more than just solve that particular problem. So it's still larger than the black um, cross. Uh, that's our um, the, the problem to solve. For single purpose processor, you can see that that it is exactly match of our problem. That processor is designed for our purpose to calculate the summation of these n numbers. Okay? So use this three different pictures, we want to illustrate the different functionalities, capabilities of different processor technologies. For general purpose processors, it's a programmable device used in a variety of applications. Uh, it's often referred to as microprocessors or sometimes microcontrollers. It has program memory. It has a data path uh, with large number of registers. And ALUs could be a fixed point or floating point ALU. The benefit of using such a processor is that you can have very short time to market. Because the development tools are well known, and also people uh, have been using this kind of processors for different kinds of applications. As a result, the NRE cost is low, because you can easily find people who can program this processor. It has very high flexibility. You can use it to do all kinds of different things games, um, 
picture processing software, um, word processing software. So you can do it. Um, you can use this processor for all different kinds of applications. Penim, of course, is an old name here. Uh, newer Intel processors uh, belong to this category. For single purpose processors, um, the design circuits, the digital circuits are designed to execute exactly one program. It is also known as coprocessor, accelerator, or peripherals. Uh, you can have a graphics coprocessor as a part of your system, or even on chip as part of the um, system on chip package. This processor, um, this kind of processor contains only the components needed to execute a single program. It does not pro have program memory, uh, so you cannot program it. The benefit of having such a special purpose or single purpose processor is because this kind of processor is designed and optimized for that task. It's very fast. And because it's optimized, uh, oftentimes it consumes uh, lower power than other general purpose um, implementation. And it's small in size. Application processors are something in between, between the general purpose and the single purpose. These application specific processors are programmable they are optimized for a particular class of applications. Not necessarily a single function, but they can do a lot more in this class. Um, it's a, a compromise between general purpose processor and the single um, purpose processors. It has a program memory, it has optimized data path, and most importantly, it has specialized functional units to implement um, very specific task in um, application domain. For example, uh, you can have a um, encryption unit as part of a network processor, which is a representative application specific processor for network applications. The benefits are uh, you have a degree of flexibility. You can still write program uh, for this processor. Uh, it has very good performance uh, for this type of applications, and it's optimized in terms of the size and power consumption. So we just talked about these three different processor technologies, general purpose processor, single purpose processor, and in between we have the application specific processor. Now we move on to a second technology we want to discuss a little bit here. Uh, it's called IC technology. By IC technology, we refer to how the digital, um, the gate level implementation is mapped onto a integrated circuit or the chip. IC technologies uh, differ in their customization to a design. ICs consist of numerous layers, uh, perhaps even 10 or more layers. And IC technologies differ with respect to which builds each layer and when. So when you have a chip, um, apart from programming the chip, what are the low level, gate level functionalities that we can change, what we can customize? That's the IC technology we're discussing here. Some chips, you cannot change anything, but some chips, you can change a lot of things. We're going to look at three types of IC technologies. Beginning with the first one, full customized uh, VRSI. Full custom, it's not customized, I should say. Full custom means it is designed for your particular purpose from the beginning to the end. Once it's done, it's done. Okay. There's no way you can change it after it's fabricated. All the masking, all the fabrication are done uh, pre-hand. 
based on your specification of the design, based on what kind of uh, processing capability you want to have, what kind of um, uh, accelerators you want to have. The second one is so-called semi-custom ASIC. Uh, it's sometimes called gate array or standard cell. This is the case where you have most of the chip uh, layers are done, but you do have some flexibility to do um, some additional wiring between or among the um, components uh, fabricated on the chip. The third one is so-called programmable logic device, or PLD. In the early days, we have programmable logic array. Uh, now we normally use so-called FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. Uh, these belong to the PLD category. Full custom VRSI. This is the case, all layers, we're talking about the uh, chip uh, fabrication, all the layers, uh, optimized for an embedded system's particular design implementation. So given the specification of your design, what is the performance requirement and what is the power requirement, uh, what are the special units you want to put in, and how you're going to route uh, the connections between those logic gates, all these are predefined, optimized uh, in the process. So this includes placing transistors, sizing the transistors, routing wires. The benefits is mostly on the performance and power. You will have excellent performance when you have this specially designed chip for your situation. And you will have a chip with a very small footprint and it consumes uh, the least amount of power compared to other IC technologies. But this comes with the cost. Uh, you're going to have to um, bear in mind that you're going to have very high uh, non-recurring engineering cost. You're going to spend a lot of money in the design phase in order to get this um, product, the chip, um, to the market or fit into your system. Uh, as a result, you're going to have very long time to market. Um, and we explained earlier that the long time to market means you're going to take a hit on the profit, right? Because your rivals may be having a similar product earlier than you. The second category is the semi custom design. This is the case where lower layers are fully or partially built. The designers, when you get this chip, you do have the option to uh, do some um, routing of the wires and maybe placing uh, some additional blocks or enabling some additional blocks. The benefits of having this Summit custom design is, of course, the performance and size Compared to the fully custom design uh, method, uh, you can have lower NRE cost because most of the chips, um, you can do additional customization and um, you do have some flexibility. The drawbacks is uh, it still requires a long time to get your final product um, completed. The third IC technology is the Programmable Logic Device, the PLD. In this case, the chip you're going to have, all the layers already exist. Um, you can get this chip and you can change the connections between the gates or some building blocks on the chip using some design tools. In the case of FPGA, you know you can have this um, vendor provided design tools like Xilinx provide uh, ICE or Altera provide you quarters too. You can write uh, VHDL or Verilog language uh, using this language to build your design and then um, do synthesis, do place and route, and your design can be loaded to the FPGA.
the benefits of using these kind of PLDs, um, especially FPGAs nowadays, is the low NRE cost. You can get the chip. It's not a chip specially designed for your application, but you can take the chip, uh, hire a bunch of um, FPGA programmers, engineers, to work on the design, and quickly to implement the design uh, using the FPGA chip. Compared to the other two IC technologies, uh, the PLD-based approach, you're gonna end up having a bigger chip, okay? and it's gonna cost more per chip, and we're talking about large quantities. Okay? Also, for this PLD type of uh, approach, uh, the chip consumes more power than those fully customized or semi-customized uh, designs. I want to spend a two slides on Moore's Law. I'm sure you're very familiar with this term, Moore's Law, and many of you know that uh, it, it, Gordon Moore predicts that the IC transistor capacity gonna double every 18 months. And this trend has been holding for the last over a decade, even more. So we do see the transistors on a chip doubles every 18 months. And people have been pushing very hard to smaller and smaller transistor size uh, we now get to 45 nanometers and even lower 20 nanometers technology. There's some skepticism about Moore's Law. Uh, some challenge how far this Moore's Law can go. This growth has been steady until 2005. Um, there's some slowdown with different barriers. Uh, the limiting factor is the transistor count and also the power consumption when you put more and more, more of these transistors on a chip. To address these challenges, people have been uh, doing a lot of different approaches. For example, uh, chip multiprocessor or multi-core is one way to deal with this power consumption problem because you cannot um, I increase the clock frequency of the processor uh, anymore because once you increase it, the power consumption is going to uh, quadruple. So you have to deal with the power consumption using different approach. And multi-core is one solution to that. Also, people have been reducing the uh, voltage of the uh, processors to reduce the power consumption. Also, temperature is uh, coming with the power consumption. Uh, how do you dissipate the um, power quickly from the chip so that it stays relatively stable temperature uh, so that it can operate um, in a consistent way? The new development on um, silicon technology is pushing the limit even smaller. And just talk about the new trend, multi-cores. Uh, you didn't see or you won't see significant higher frequency. Also the progress in the nanotechnology. So the Moore's Law is still the golden principle that people have been trying very hard to keep up with. Um, so far it's been doing well. People have been doing well in getting the goal, uh, but uh, we'll have to see uh, what will happen in the next five, 10 years, uh, where we'll go, um, or how we can go even further to push the limit. So we talked about um, processor technology, IC technology, uh, in the next couple of slides, I will talk about design technology. So it's the 
method that been take people have been using to design embedded systems. In the past, when you design a system, you can use either use hardware or software. You're gonna take most likely very different approaches. You will either implement the design using hardware or you're gonna use a software approach. Now, the recent progress uh, people have been uh, working on is to try to unify or merge these two so that you can, when you consider design, you have to think both hardware and software at the same time. That's what we call hardware and software co-design. This is because hardware and software each has its own advantages and disadvantages. The same function, although it can be implemented either in hardware or software, if you implement it in hardware, you will gain on performance, but you're gonna lose the flexibility. On the other hand, if you implement in software, you will have very high um, flexibility, but you're gonna probably lose on the performance and on some other um, metrics. So after time, a manager, a lead of the design team has to struggle to find out what are the functionalities it's better to implement those in hardware and what are the functionalities it's better to implement in software. Um, the picture on this slide shows you two ladders. Uh, one, the left one is on the software design and the right one is on the hardware. So from the top to bottom, each ladder sees different stages uh, where these stages representing um, the technologies that were popular in certain time frames. For example, um, in the early days, when we people when people design software, because we didn't have very useful, friendly compilers, so they have to start with assembly language program. Once you have mature compilers, people can write programs in high-level languages because the compiler can do the work translating these high-level language programs into assembly language, into machine language, which can be understood by the processor. Um, after compilers, um, people have been working on different software tools, especially people need tools for new processor technologies. For example, with the emergence of multiple processors uh, or systems with large number of processors such as cloud computing platforms, you have to think about how you can write a program for these systems with a large number of processor cores. This is what we call parallel programming. A compiler alone cannot solve the problem. You have to have higher level programming paradigms, for example, MapReduce uh, or Hadoop different programming uh, frameworks that help the programmers, the designers to design um, systems that has multiple uh, or many processor cores. On the hardware side, uh, the design tools have gone through similarly a number of iterations. Uh, at the very beginning, you, you, when you design a hardware unit, you start with uh, uh, logic equations. You do state machines. Uh, that's what we did in the logic design course. And after that, you do uh, register uh, transfer level designs. And then later on, you use behavior synthesis tools uh, to design um, system more efficiently, more quickly. So there are also various tools uh, available uh, um, recently to help you 
improve the productivity of hardware design. So the takeaway message here is, when you design a system uh, that consists of both hardware and software, you have to think carefully uh, what are the functionalities you want to put in hardware, what are the functionalities you want to put in software. You have to analyze, measure the trade-offs between these different approaches in terms of power, performance, energy cost, etc. And there's no fundamental differences between what hardware or software can implement. You can do it either way, but you want to find the best suitable way for your design. We talked about three different technologies, especially at the beginning we talked about processor technology, and after that, we talked about IC technology. The basic trade-off here is general, general versus custom. If you want to have general, that means you want flexibility, and you want to go with general purpose processors or those PLDs. Right? PLDs is not another way to look at the flexibility uh, or the generality of the design. On the other hand, if you want to have good performance, low power consumption, you want to use um, special purpose processors. Also, you want to have full customized chips. That's how you can have the best customized design with the best performance and power consumption. But we want to point out here these two technologies, the processor technology and the IC technology, are independent. We have a diagram here. What we see on the top of the diagram, that's the processor technology we talked about. Right? From the general purpose processor to application specific processor to general purpose processor. At the bottom, we have three kinds of IC technologies that we just discussed. We have the programmable logic device, we have the semi-customer design, and we have full custom design. And you see those arrows from each one of these processor technologies to each one of these IC technologies. That's the mapping relationship we're trying to illustrate here. To give you an example, we can decide to have a general purpose processor. We're talking about this processor technology here. That means we're going to have a general purpose processor with certain instruction set, with certain compilers, and you can write programs for this processor uh, using whatever high level language this compiler supports, and you can have very um, fast time to market because you are using this general purpose processors. All the tools are very familiar and you can easily hire people to work on it. This particular processor, this general purpose processor, can be implemented with either one of these three IC technologies. Let me start with the PLD. So you can have a processor implemented using a FPGA. Okay. For example, you can have a, an ARM core, we call it soft core processor, implemented on a Xilinx FPGA or a Terra FPGA. What you have is still the same instruction set that you expect to have from an ARM processor, but underneath the implementation is based on FPGA. Okay. Now with FPGA, you know you have these uh, characteristics you can get the chip right away. Okay? You can buy from um, off the shop, from market, and you will be able to use um, the vendor provided tools to do additional FPGA or logic uh, modules on these FPGA chip. 
Now, the second way to implement this general purpose processor is to use semi custom. Okay, you can use semi custom chip to implement the instruction set. On the other extreme, for a particular general purpose chip, let's say an Intel x86 processor, you can use a full customized design. You can buy the chip, okay? So that chip, for you, you cannot change the functionality because it's fully custom. All mm -hmm. the fabrication is done. There's no way you can change the design of that chip, but that is a general purpose processor. You can still write software on top of that. Similarly, you can take other processor technologies, application specific or single purpose, and map these different processors onto different IC technologies. Yes? So the semi custom is uh, well, it's it's kind of in between. You don't really use a full fledged HDL, uh, VHDL, or very long pro, uh, program to program it. They have special tools that you can manipulate the connections of the chip. Pardon me. Um, I think um, Xilinx has some, and. Uh, Altera also has some. I don't know the exact model number, but there are certain special designed um, chips that you can you can get from those vendors. Now we want to talk about design productivity. Um, If you hire people to work on a design, some people are working on hardware, some people are working on software, the productivity um, overall is increasing over the years because of the development of different tools, development tools, training, and technology advances, etc. But the um, rate of this increase we're talking about this here example, this uh, designer productivity. If you compare that with the increase of the capacity in terms of the uh, transistors on the chip, you will see a gap. So what I'm trying to say here is you're going to have more and more powerful chips with more resources that available on the chip that you can leverage, but because of the lack or lack of the tools and training of the people, the productivity uh, is not keeping up uh, the pace. So you will see an increasing gap between these two. This figure shows um, on the x-axis, that's the time in terms of the year. Mm -hmm. And on the y-axis, on the left, is the transistor per chip in millions, and it's in log scale. And the y-axis on the right is the productivity uh, of people uh, in unit of 1,000 transistors per person per month. So that means um, how much effort you have to spend per people in order to take advantage of these um, transistors. You will see this gap is keep increasing. To give you some numbers, in 1981, the lead edge chip, leading edge chip required 100 designers months to design. In 2012, uh, for designing a chip, you require over 30,000 designer months because of this gap. In 
And the cost of this de design, the designers increased from 1 million to 300 million over the years. Now, this slide just want to uh, touch upon the idea of men month. Okay. We often use men month to measure the productivity uh, or to measure the workload. In theory, you can add more people on the design team to improve the productivity, to reduce the time to market, to push the product uh, finish as soon as possible. But the reality is you can increase the productivity by adding team members on the team only to a certain extent. This is because the interaction among the team members, the complexity of the management will eventually uh, eat the benefit of increasing the number of people in a team. So this bottom figure shows the, uh, what's called the myth, mythical month. Um, so as you can see, when you increase the number of designers, um, the month to completion increase, sorry, decreases, but it peaks at about uh, 20 some people. When you increase even larger, the team actually has um, lower productivity. So the completion time actually increases. So that's the uh, story of too many cooks. Okay, so we talked about the general design principles, overview of embedded system design. Uh, we discussed different processor technologies, IC technologies. We looked at the design technology, uh, also the uh, productivity. Here we want to move on to uh, look at embedded processors. There's certain requirements on the embedded processors. For example, low power consumption, programmable, low cost. These are often the uh, requirements of embedded processors. We have, we call different types of embedded processors. We broadly classify them in two categories microcontroller type and microprocessor type. Microcontroller type processor is often self-contained. By self-contained, we mean that this kind of processors have on-chip memory, they have I.O. devices or I.O. pins, they have on-chip analog to digital conversion unit, and they have many other uh, units, special function units. And on this type of processors, you do not really run an operating system because an OS is, is too heavy, too uh, complex for such a single purpose or uh, application specific processor. And because it is used often in the less interact environment. For example, in an industry environment, you want to use these kind of processors to um, do sensor data acquisition and maybe do a little bit additional signal processing. There are many examples of these type of processor. Microchip PIC, which is the one we're going to use in our first lab, uh, Intel 8051 based microcontrollers, and so on. The other type is what we call, yes. Um, well, you can say that some of the high-end microcontroller, they are general purpose. 
uh, you can use the process for many different functions. For example, you can uh, use it for a um, remote control or control the microwave. Um, but I, I, I think I want to say general purpose, we often mean those microprocessor type of processors. In the second category, uh, these processors, they are system on chip. So they have uh, not only the ALUs, the registers, they often have some special units. They have demultiplexed address bus and data bus. They have coprocessors, and they have standard system buses. And on these processors, oftentimes we run certain operating system, either real-time operating system or embedded operating system, for example, uh, Android, iOS, um, or embedded Linux. And we use these type of processors in more interactive environments. For example, uh, set up boxes in vehicle entertainment systems, etc. The representative processors are Intel Atom processor, uh, which is the one we're going to use in our labs, and some other processors as well.